Hello and welcome to Cranfield University. My name is Andrei Pavlov and I'm a professor of strategy and performance in the School of Management. And in the studio with me today, I've got Dr. Tom Gertz, professor of finance at Bucknell University in the United States. Tom, welcome to Cranfield. Thank you. Well, welcome back to Cranfield, I should say. My second time. Yes, exactly. And so you spent this morning working with our executive MBA students. Uh, how did this go? I think it went very well. Uh, they're a very lively bunch, asked a lot of questions. Uh, I enjoyed it. Fantastic. We love them as well. Good. Can I ask you to tell us a bit more about what you did this morning? What did you discuss with the students? Sure. Um, so I talked about how COVID uh, affects cash flow and value of real estate and how uh, institutional investors, real estate investors, uh, but also the banks respond to that, make strategic decisions uh, for going forward in this perhaps new normal, or are we going back to the original situation? And what do these companies have to do in order to survive going forward? And is there an answer? Are we going back to the uh, old normal or are we into the new normal? Well, that was very interesting to have the discussion with your students. They were not, uh, uh, they were divided on that answer too. Uh, and perhaps there is no good answer at this point. Fair enough. So I know that real estate finance is your thing, is your specialty. But I also know that your current research is, or your current research interests are in global capital flows and Correct. in the way companies invest money uh, globally. Can I just ask you to tell us a little bit more about this? Um, and maybe, maybe to start us off, because not everyone in our audience is a specialist in, uh, in global finance. Can I just start with a very broad and very basic question? but may not be a basic question, you'll tell me in a second. Why do companies actually invest abroad? Very good, sure. Um, so I mostly look at uh, investments in real estate uh, because obviously when uh, a company invests in real estate and makes the decision to go abroad, right? When it, when it comes to real estate, you're gonna make a big investment, but also for a long period of time. So that means therefore that it is different than just going in, buying stocks and selling them again. Uh, it, it requires a whole new, different look at making those decisions. Now, typically there's two reasons why companies do this. They can either do it because they want to expand their market share. And in this case, right, if we're talking about real estate, they might say, okay, I need an office there. Uh, and, and I want to have a presence there, maybe a factory, or maybe um, they, they do it because they want to uh, uh, make certain investments in that country. So that, the, yeah, to, yeah, just to, yeah, so that would be the kind of obvious reason, I suppose. Correct. Yeah. Um, but they, they might want to diversify their risk, right? If you are an institutional investor, right. like a right. bank or a pension fund, they will go abroad and they will have different investments in different countries because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And that's why, and that's how you can reduce your risk uh, by, by diversifying. Right, so it's a more subtle, more strategic reason, I suppose. Correct, correct, yes. And from what I understand, your research is about how companies make the decision to do that, to, to, diver well, to invest abroad. That is correct, yes. So I've been looking at uh, different countries, uh, or actually I should say continents, uh, South America and Africa, and looking at why does capital flow in certain countries and why do they not go into other countries? Uh, because obviously when companies make those decisions for investing long-term into real estate, right? Like I already said, that is a commitment that you make. Yes. So you need to have an idea of, okay, I'm going into country A, but I not don't wanna go into country B. Uh, and that's obviously a very important decision to make, but also to understand why companies make that decision and on what they base that decision. So what's the answer? How do they make that decision and what do they base it on? So um, in 1990, Douglas North got the uh, Nobel Prize uh, and he said that uh, what is very important is to understand the institutional framework uh, uh, within which uh, companies operate. and. Uh, uh, that is something that I've been looking at for a long period of time already. Uh, in 1992, I published a paper together with my then uh, thesis advisor about why country, why, why again, why do companies invest in other countries? Um, and 
uh, at that point, there was already some uh, literature, a body of literature that said that there are a, re a number of reasons why companies do that or better, why they do not do that. Right. Because, Andre, uh, it's very interesting if in the, in the literature, um, it is observed that companies, although there, as we already discussed, there are good reasons why to go abroad, um, they are actually under investing typically abroad. They have something mm. what is known as the home asset bias. Right. They have a uh, bias towards their home assets, and therefore they do not diversify that much as they should be. And uh, other authors uh, uh, gave uh, explanations uh, that, uh, uh, that explained part of that. But my research in those days already looked at this institutional framework that I just cited uh, from Douglas North to sort of say, okay, what also matters is the institutional framework in countries where you invest, because that determines, partially determines why countries, why investors will go to that country and will ignore other countries. Right. That sounds really interesting. And the institutional framework, I suppose, to, to me, who is uh, who's not an expert in this field, involves quite a lot of different factors. It's the whole gamut of forces, of institutional forces that make the climate attractive or less attractive. Correct. So how did you look into it? What is the institutional framework? Are there any factors that are more important than others? Talk more about this. Yes, uh, that's a very good question because obviously in itself, the institutional framework is rather vague. Uh, it is defined exactly, exactly. as yeah. as uh, the it, as what defines and limits the sets of choices of in this case investors, and that can be as you point out very broad. Um, when we wrote this paper initially, when we did this research initially, we looked at cultural factors. Right, different countries have different cultures. Um, we looked at central banks. Uh, how how much influence do they have? And also political risk. How stable is the uh, political system? economic risk, uh, how do they treat foreigners, uh, what are the policies uh, with respect to uh, uh, investors coming from abroad. So it's a wide, very wide range with which we try to operationalize that in itself very vague statement by Douglas North. How do you define that institutional framework? And then we try to uh, identify, operationalize what that exactly means. The problem was, you can operationalize it, but then you have to measure it, right? You, of course, yeah. you have to quantify it. And basically that's where our research stopped at that moment, because how do you measure the culture of a country? How do you measure the treatment of foreigners? Um, and that was frankly, at that point, the end of my research, of our research. Uh, it's a well-cited paper, but without quantifying it, it's very important to do actually analytical research. Now, the interesting thing is, that uh, in the um, uh, end 1990s, uh, the first uh, 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 attempts were made to quantify these different uh, uh, factors. Um, interestingly enough, very similar to what we had uh, hypothesized in our paper, what we think how you should operationalize the institutional framework, um, they started to measure that. Right. And by now, 20 years later, that's good. Uh, uh, we have a, we have now a data set. We can actually start testing whether or not which of these factors that have now been quantified right. um, uh, matter and which one which ones don't. Right. So, what countries did you look at, and what did you find? What are the factors that really matter? Um, I looked uh, primarily first at South America and uh, and and later uh, Africa. South America is very interesting because it has developed countries, stable countries like Chile and, and Uruguay. On the other hand, you have Venezuela, which is a country that is in, has a very weak institutional framework, let's put it this way. Then you have Brazil that is sort of in the middle and sort of stable. Mm -hmm. Then you have Argentina, which has, was very developed and very strong in terms of its institutional framework, but has been gradually declining. And then you have Colombia, which was sort of doing okay it went down civil war and then it went up again. So you have a, a wide gamut of, of different countries and you can really say, okay, here there's a change in the institutional framework and see what happens to FDI, foreign direct investment, 
Um, while other countries had positive change, improvement, strengthening of the institutional framework, and they saw indeed a, an increase in foreign direct investment. All right. And you're holding on to the answer. So what is the answer? The answer what, is, what really matters? The answer, uh, and you asked that question. I'm sorry for not directly answering that. I really get excited about the topic and then I go on a tangent, which I'm doing right now. We'll Central bank independence, which is something that has been researched before right. and makes sense. Bribery and corruption. Um, and how uh, a, a country uh, sets its laws with respect to foreign investors. Right. So let me just recap this. So what what makes a, co a country uh, an attractive target for foreign direct investment uh, are three things. Basically, uh, yes. They explain most of the, they explain variation. Most of the variation. Right. Correct. Um, that's the independence of their central bank Correct. In, the, in the country, um, the treatment of foreigners mm -hmm. uh, or the welcoming right, of foreigners. I think, yeah. Um, and the level of bribery and corruption Correct. in the country. And it's interesting. So you so you've looked at you've looked at South America with all of that variation and diversity within the continent, uh, as you've just described. Um, so are you saying that these three factors uh, and the, this research finding holds across these different countries? Yes, um, they explain most of the variation. Um, uh, they're significant. They have a significant impact. With one uh, very important uh, um, addition. There is a lag between a change in the institutional framework, in particular to these three factors that you that we just mentioned. There is a three year lag uh, because, right, if you think about it, in, 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 investors, right, there might be a change, a significant change, a reduction in bribery and corruption because stronger legal framework that right. cracks right. down on that. It doesn't mean that institutional investors immediately say, oh, now we need to go to country A. There's a lag. Right, it takes right. time. Yeah, um, a three-year lag, to be exact. Okay. Uh, so uh, I looked at multiple years, and it turns out that that is uh, yeah. the typical lag. And it right again, it makes sense. It takes time before knowledge about the change in the institutional framework dissipates in the market, and that institutional investors uh, react to that. They need to do due diligence in in terms of what real estate should should I buy, um, and. Three years later, you will actually see a change in foreign direct investor investment, uh, a positive change if the institutional framework strengthens, yes. uh, uh, a negative impact on the FDI if the institutional framework weakens. Right. Um, also important to notice is that there is a minimum level of uh, strength of the institutional framework before before uh, anything happens at all. Exactly, right, exactly, right, right. exactly. Interestingly enough, when I looked at Africa, I saw the same thing. Okay. So that is very encouraging, right? Because it's not just a South American thing, but there also a country has, has come through what I call a threshold value uh, in the institutional framework before foreign direct investment actually flows or sign a significant amount of foreign direct investment actually flows into that country. Right. And so in and in all of these cases, what you're saying is um, what really matters in terms of the strength of that institutional framework are these three factors. It explains most of the variables. Yes, uh, yes, the, the yes variation. Yes. yes, I'm right. I don't want to say that is everything that matters, uh, but those you, you're, you're being properly scientific. About yes, it. I very am. Good. I yes, am. very good. Yes. Right. Uh, but but you're right. Uh, there, there are other things, uh, but uh, with right they will have the right sign but they're not as significant as these three uh, uh factors that that explains again most of this behavior of global firms that's my firm belief yes okay okay so i wonder how transferable these findings are to other economies so in south america in africa many of these economies are um, emergent markets emergent economies some of them are frontier markets mm -hmm. um so it's it's interesting whether we can um, we can um, use some of these findings to explain what's going on in in developed markets as well. Correct. And when I was preparing for this interview, um, I um, uh, I've looked at the foreign direct investment in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, and I saw that um, the over the past couple of years the for, the level of FDI in the UK has been going down. What would your research say about this, and how would how do you think what do you, what do you think the UK could do to um, 
to make it more attractive to FDI? Very good question. Um, first of all, uh, like I already said, the beauty of South America is that you have all these different countries, right? Uh, obviously, if I would look at Western Europe, if they're all the same institutional framework, there's not enough variation. Right, you can't do research. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. But uh, the United Kingdom is an interesting thing, an interesting country, because obviously Brexit has changed the institutional framework. Yes. Um, so uh, I need more years, more data to actually look uh, of what is going on in the United Kingdom in terms of its FDI. But at a certain point, I can do that, right, if there's enough data points uh, to look at this. But I am pretty sure that at that point, I will find similar results because, as I already said, in South America, right, with Uruguay and Chile uh, to be uh, developed countries, that the, the, the we will see a similar impact in the inst uh, um, of those three variables that we mentioned earlier. On the other hand, the British Central Bank, right, is independent. We yes. can be reliant on that. They seem to be very independent of the political system. Yep. Um, bribery and corruption, um, I don't think, is going to be such a big issue very here. Low. So that yep. really leaves uh, the, 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 the laws with respect to trade freedom uh, of foreigners coming into the United Kingdom. And that variable, right, and again, if we're looking at what is going on in the United Kingdom, the news around it, that is really the variable that matters here. Because it's right. not just uh, uh, that foreign direct investment in the United Kingdom has been declining, it's also that there's more variation, right? And that is a reflection of the concern about, okay, what are these laws going to be? What are they going to be in the long run? Is there going to be a stability at a certain point? Mm. Can we rely on the new laws? And until that has been cleared up, and again, that is my research from these other countries, until that has been cleared up in this case, you will see a decline or maybe it will stop at a certain point, but definitely the volatility will be there. Um, and that, yeah, that creates an uns that uncertainty will stay in that market until there is a resolution mm -hmm. uh, with respect to how are we going to deal with foreign investment. So for us here, that's the variable that matters. Absolutely, yes. Um, and uh, I think that that is a, a very important lesson for politicians, uh, because obviously, right, if you want to attract that foreign direct investment, which is a big motor, which is a big engine for uh, for economic activity, that is really where you have to make the decisions. And, 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 and it's not so much of what those ultimate decisions are, I believe, it is very much that there is a decision, there is a clear path it's forward. It's a signal, right? Is exactly, that, yeah. Yeah. right? Because then companies can adjust themselves to that and they can say, okay, now we know what's going to happen. Mm. Now, remember the lag of three years that I talked about, it's not going to be like that, True. right? It's going to take time for the market to stabilize, to recognize the United Kingdom uh, with respect to its laws and its change of the laws and stability of the laws in this respect. And then they say, okay, now we know what can happen. Now we know what to do with this. Fascinating findings and thank very impact, impactful research. Professor Gertz, thank you very much. Thank you, Andre, for having me.